You're listening to Dallas Theological Seminary's Chapel Podcast, a clear voice in chaotic times. Our chapel speaker today is David Brickner, who's the executive director for Jews for Jesus. David heads up the largest Jewish evangelistic mission in the world, Jews for Jesus, exists, and I love this statement, to make the messiahship of Jesus an unavoidable issue to Jewish people worldwide. Isn't that a great statement? To make that an unavoidable issue. Mr. Brickner is a popular church and conference speaker whose messages have been distinctly Jewish perspective as he proclaims the gospel of Jesus Christ. He sees Jews for Jesus as a cutting edge ministry that's over 2,000 years old. He's born in Beverly, Massachusetts, raised in a Jewish Christian home, fifth generation Jewish believer in Jesus. He considers himself living proof that following Jesus does not lead a person to abandon one's Jewish identity. He has been uh, seen on uh, Larry King and other programs. He is a great spokesman, spokesman for our savior he resides in San Francisco with his wife, Patty, and two children. David, it's a delight to have you back on campus here at DTS. Would you join me in welcoming Dave Brickner? Wow. Well, thank you. Shalom. Shalom. It is great to be back on campus, and I can assure you I'm not always as warmly welcomed as I travel on behalf of Jews for Jesus. People hear that name, and immediately there's controversy. You know, how can that be? Jews for Jesus, that's like saying vegetarians for meat. <laughs> not too long ago, I was handing out gospel tracts, and a Jewish fellow approached me. He said, how can you be a Jew for Jesus? I said to him, well, Jesus was Jewish, right? He thought a minute. He said, yeah, Jesus was Jewish, but then he converted and became a Catholic. <laughs> so there is a great deal of misunderstanding, but I'm so thankful to be among those who do understand. We are so grateful for the deep friendship, uh, abiding relationship that we have with Dallas Theological Seminary, with your president, with Dr. Harold Honer, who is a member of our board of directors, and my own Susan Perlman, my first assistant, is a member of the DTS board. And so we have that relationship but it's important to us who are in the field of Jewish missions because Dallas Seminary serves as a canon today, as a measuring rod for evangelical vibrancy that really affects the entire church. Uh, the best Bible schools, Moody and Multnomah, look to a place like Dallas Theological Seminary to continue to uphold that doctrine once delivered to the saints. And your well-known commitment to Jewish evangelism, your love for the Jewish people and for the nation of Israel is unparalleled throughout the country. And so I want to say thank you for being that kind of standard bearer in a time when those kinds of issues are beginning to see slippage throughout the evangelical church. Later on this evening here in Dallas, there's going to be a big rally at a church, a night to honor Israel. And there will be many of my Jewish people there to hear a leading evangelical televangelist. And I can tell you right now that he will not offend those Jewish people by telling them that they need Jesus. He talks a lot about friendship. But I ask, how can you be a friend and not tell someone about the only hope for salvation, which is Jesus Christ? As a Jew... I don't need to be honored, but I believe that the God of Israel does need to be honored. And the best way to honor him is to introduce my people to Israel's Messiah. And I'm so grateful that Dallas Theological Seminary stands firmly for that truth. The last time I was with you, I shared about some of our evangelistic activities and particularly Operation Behold Your God which was a commitment we had to have saturation evangelistic outreaches in every city outside of Israel with a Jewish population of 25,000 or more. And we came to a grand finale of that five and a half year campaign in New York City this summer. And we had some Dallas Seminary grads who were there with us on the streets. And we saw a tremendous outpouring of interest, uh, a, a tremendous focus uh, that led to many Jewish people and non-Jews coming to faith in Christ. What was particularly interesting about this campaign 
was the unusual attention that was paid by the secular press, the media. And uh, we ended up having over 15 different television reports on the campaign, over 40 different newspaper stories, both national and international. And I thought, just to give you a flavor of that, we would show just one of those 15 television clips. So let's go ahead and take a look at one of those clips together. With Bill Ritter and Liz Coe, Scott Clark with sports, and Sam Champion with the exclusive AccuWeather forecast. Now, Eyewitness News at 6. In tonight's extra, a religious campaign in full swing these days. Maybe you've seen their posters or been handed one of the, their brochures. It's an unlikely group with a seemingly contradictory name, Jews for Jesus. And one of the groups they're targeting for recruitment, Orthodox Jews. Here's Stacey Sager. It's certainly a massive outreach here in the New York area. Above and beyond the usual handouts at street corners and subway stations, you can now find Jews for Jesus ads plastered on billboards. There's direct mailings, even radio announcements. Well, this is the biggest campaign that we've had in New York in our 33-year history. The group's executive director tells us this next month here in the city is a culmination of a five-year project to blanket areas outside Israel with a Jewish population of 25,000 or more. But the question is, just how many takers will there be? It doesn't bother me. It really doesn't. So you'll take it home and read it? Not really. I'm just going to throw it out. And for some leaders in the Jewish community, it's a whole lot worse than that. To them, the suggestion that Jews can perceive Jesus as their Messiah is spiritually offensive. You know, what we find offensive is that Jews for Jesus are defining Judaism for us. And we would never, for example, have a group called Christianity without Christ. What we don't like is apathy, and we're certainly not getting that from New York. We have antagonism. They don't seem to mind soliciting nice those who would be the most unlikely to convert either. And the campaign includes far more than just advertisements and pamphlets. For the first time ever, the Jews for Jesus are targeting the Hasidic community here in New York. In fact, they've even sent out 80,000 DVDs in Yiddish. And we've been li literally getting thousands of phone calls from Hasids who received that DVD. As for the tourists, they too are overwhelmed. But this is New York, so what do you expect? The Jews for Jesus say expected to continue until August. In Midtown, I'm Stacy Sager, Channel 7, Eyewitness News. <laughs> well, yeah, the controversy continues. And, uh, you know, that outreach to the ultra-Orthodox or the Hasidic community was the first time in modern times that we're aware that this has been attempted and we did in fact send 78,000 of the Jesus film in Yiddish directly into the homes of Hasidim throughout Brooklyn and in New Jersey places like New City and Curious Joel and there has been a tremendous and an ongoing response and so far seven of these Hasidim have prayed to receive Jesus as Messiah. That, now, that may sound like a small number, a drop in the bucket, when you consider sending out 78,000 pieces, but for us, it's a remarkable response, and of course, we're still in contact with many others who've expressed interest. Along with that, there was a great deal of openness among Russian-speaking Jews to the extent that we were able to plant a small and growing congregation of Russian Jewish believers in Brooklyn, New York. So praise God for those of you who are praying for us. We really appreciate that. And I want to give you an opportunity to be more involved in Jews for Jesus. We, as I said, had some Dallas Seminary graduates with us on the streets. And uh, when you came in today, you should have received a card that looks like this. I'm going to ask you to take that card out. And uh, we want to give you the opportunity to get our Jews for Jesus newsletter and to find out more about what's going on in the ministry. Some of you may already get our newsletter, but I want you to take this card anyway and go ahead and fold along the perforation, and then we'll tear it together on the count of three. And uh, because this is such a fine seminary, I'm going to count to three in Hebrew, and you'll know when to rip, okay? Echad, shtaim, shalosh. All right. Some of you haven't taken Hebrew yet, but uh, 
This smaller section is for you to keep, a prayer reminder card, and uh, we encourage you to use it to pray for the ministry of Jews for Jesus. And if you know someone who's Jewish who needs Jesus, put their name in that blank. Put this card in your Bible in a place where you'll see it and remember to pray. Now, the larger section of the card, if you'll fill it out with your name and address and boxes to check on the front and back and drop it either here at the front or at the literature table in the back, my friend Heidi is there to help you and to to uh, show you some of the materials that we have with Jews for Jesus. Some of it's free and some of it's not so free. So help yourself to the free and talk to Heidi before you help yourself to the not so free. But along with the newsletter and more information about Jews for Jesus, I want to send you a book uh, that uh, I think you'll find to be valuable for your library. I'll send it to you free of charge. It's called Christ and the Feast of Tabernacles. And uh, being the author, I can't tell you how good it is. But uh, uh, it's published by Moody Publishing, and uh, I think it will really open your eyes to the connection between this final feast in the Jewish calendar and God's plan for redemption for all the ages. And so fill out that card and uh, turn it in. We'll send you the newsletter. We'll send you a copy of the book. You know, the Feast of Tabernacles is connected to the holiday that we just completed in celebrating Thanksgiving. The pilgrims initially were... Uh, seeing themselves coming to the new Israel and they wanted to adopt the festivals uh, and uh, their Thanksgiving, their first Thanksgiving, was in fact an attempt to have their own Feast of Tabernacles in this new land. The Feast of Tabernacles is also connected to an upcoming Jewish holiday that's not well known in the church and it is the festival of Hanukkah. And so I thought that today, in our remaining time, I would talk to you a little bit about Hanukkah, not only its relationship to the Feast of Tabernacles, but also to the Christmas story. In fact, I would go so far as to say that without Hanukkah, there would be no Christmas. And you might say to me, well, that's uh, quite a statement. And I hope to be able to demonstrate that to you in the remaining time. And I want to invite you to open me, with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of John. John chapter 10 is the only place in the Bible, both Old and New Testament, where there is a specific reference to the festival of Hanukkah. And so it is a question and of concern to Christians. And I think that as we take a look at this festival, you'll see the richness of this text opening up to you and also perhaps gain a greater appreciation for our coming Advent season. John chapter 10, beginning with verse 22, we'll read through verse 33. Then came the feast of dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was in the temple area, walking in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews gathered around him, saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you do not believe. The miracles I do in my Father's name speak for me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Again, the Jews picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus said to them, I have shown you many great miracles from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? We are not stoning you for any of these, replied the Jews, but for blasphemy because you, a mere man, claim to be God. What a powerful passage of Scripture. One that I believe is more fully unpacked as we understand the backdrop with what John tells us is the Feast of Dedication. And of course, in Hebrew, the word for dedication is Hanukkah. This is the festival that was being celebrated, commemorating events of history during the intertestamental times when Antiochus, known as Epiphanes, the Syrian king, with his Syrian army invaded the land of Israel, captured Jerusalem, and defiled the temple, setting up altars to the Greek pantheon, and even going so far as to sacrifice a pig, an unclean animal, on the holy altar, extinguishing the sacred light in the temple. It was a dark time for the Jewish people. And Hanukkah, dedication, commemorates that time when vastly outnumbered, a group of Jewish 
guerrilla war warriors known as the Maccabees were able to fend off the mighty Syrian army, recapture the city of Jerusalem, and rededicate the temple there. And so the, the name dedication, more commonly known today as the Festival of Lights because of many traditions that have since come to be associated with the Feast of Hanukkah. And the first time that this festival was celebrated, according to the book of Maccabees, we find that it was actually a delayed celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles because tabernacles actually occurred one month later in the calendar of Israel, and one month earlier, rather, and so it was at that time that the celebration of tabernacles began and the Feast of Hanukkah was initiated from then on. And so this has become a growing festival, considered a minor festival, though with the interest these days in the Western world in Christmas, Hanukkah in the Jewish community has taken on even greater import. And one of the things that we say to one another in the Jewish community in, at this time is, Nes Gadol Hayasham. Surely a great miracle happened there. And so this is a time for miracles. And in fact, there are three miracles associated with the festival of Hanukkah that really serve as the backdrop for our understanding of this text. In fact, you'll notice that Jesus himself there in the temple, which of course was the, the backdrop, the foundation of the celebration of the Feast of Hanukkah, Jesus himself mentions the miracles when the Jewish leadership is asking, are you really the Messiah? Tell us plainly. And Jesus points them to miracles. The miracles I do in my Father's name, they speak for me. So with miracles on the minds of his audience, Jesus directs their attention to these miracles. And the first miracle that I would mention, not necessarily coming in this particular text, but very clearly associated with this festival, is the miracle of light. Now, according to tradition, when the Maccabees recaptured the temple in Jerusalem, that sacred candelabra which illumined the sanctuary had been extinguished and according to this tradition, when the Maccabees sought to rekindle it, they only found enough oil to last for one day. And nevertheless, it would take eight whole days for new oil to be made and sanctified, set apart, made kosher for use in the temple. And so they were confronted with the dilemma. What do we do? Do we light the, the menorah only to have it go out? Or do we wait eight more days to rekindle the lamp. So they decided, according to this tradition, to rekindle the lamp, and the miracle of the light, according to Jewish tradition, is that that oil, only enough for one day, actually lasted for eight whole days. Now, of course, we don't know if this is a true miracle. It's more likely a later addition or tradition, but there is a lot of association with light in the Feast of Tabernacles. And you'll read about it in my book that this is one of the grandest and glory, most glorious celebrations, the illumination ceremony, which took place in the temple. And in John chapter 7 and 8, we see Jesus talking about that very ceremony and speaking of himself, saying, I am the light of the world. Anyone who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And so you see the light from the Feast of Tabernacles is now translated to the light of the Hanukkah menorah. And as you can see, I have one here, which I'd like to light, and I hopefully will be able to uh, have this burn for a little while here in the chapel without causing a problem. The menorah has nine candles, not eight. And the one in the temple had seven. But this is a Hanukkiah, a special candelabra for this festival, because of course the eight day tradition of that miracle has eight candles. Why then the ninth? The ninth candle is raised up above all the others and is called the shamash or the servant candle because of the promise of the shamash, the servant, from the prophet Isaiah who said, it is too little a thing that I will raise you up to speak to the tribes of Jacob, Isaiah 49, 6. I will also make you a light to the nations so that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. And so the promise of light as a messianic hope 
is now connected not only with the illumination ceremony of the Feast of Tabernacles, but even has found its way into the architecture of the Hanukkah, the, the sacred menorah. And so this shamish, this candle, is lit and is used then to bring light to all the other candles. And so the first night of Hanukkah, we would light this shamish candle and one candle, and then by the time we get to the last night, all nine candles would be burning. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam She'asa nisim lavoteinu Bayamim hahem Bazman hazeh Amen Which means, blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has done miracles and wonders in our fathers and in our day. And so this candelabra, this Hanukkah, this menorah, is then placed in the window of a Jewish home facing outward so that all the world can know not only of our commitment to this festival, but also of our hope for the coming of Messiah. And what a great burden it is for us in Jews for Jesus, and I hope for you too as well, to see these menorahs burn with the shamash, the, the hope of the Messiah, and know that my people light those candles every year not knowing that the light of the world has indeed come, and his name is Yeshua HaMashiach. Jesus is the miracle of light that the illumination ceremony of tabernacles and that the menorah, the Hanukkah, speak to. Jesus speaks of miracles, and I think that the most significant miracle, which he also alludes to in this passage, is the second miracle, which is the miracle of preservation. If you think about it, God had promised that Israel would exist before him forever, that as a unique people on the face of the earth, they would be a light to the nations. And yet, the problem with the story of Hanukkah is that Antiochus Epiphanes had other ideas. He, like so many throughout history, satanically inspired to wipe the Jewish people off the face of the earth had that commitment because he not only wanted to conquer the Jewish people, he wanted to Hellenize them. He wanted to remove from their midst the worship of the one God of Israel and force Greek worship, Greek customs. And so he forbid the circumcision of Jewish boys, the keeping of kosher, and all of the elements that God gave to Israel to make them a unique people on the face of the earth. And so if he had had his way like the Herods, the Hamans, and the Hitlers, and the Hamas, and the Hezbollah of history, Antiochus would have been successful in making God to be a liar. Because God had promised to preserve his people Israel. And I think that promise we see being carried out even to this day. God is faithful. He does not neglect his people, his chosen people. And the wonderful thing about Jesus' comment here in that context, in the context of God's preserving power of Israel, is that he says in the new covenant, those who follow him now receive the promise of God concerning that same preserving and sustaining power. That's how I see this context. When Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice, I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish and no one can snatch them out of my hand. The preserving care of Almighty God, sustaining Israel, is now extended to all of those who are children of Abraham by faith in Israel's Messiah Jesus. Isn't that a good word for us as well? And I think it was understood as being a comment on the history of God's saving power of Israel even at this holy time of Hanukkah. If you think about it, if Antiochus had had his way, there would be no Christmas because there would not have been a people for the Messiah to be born into to fulfill the promises of God. And so we come to the third and final miracle coming out of this text, which is the miracle of Emmanuel, God with us. And this is perhaps even the most startling of all of the issues the most in-your-face of Jesus' comments here in the temple in Solomon's porch. Because if you'll remember once again the story of Hanukkah, Antiochus 
came into the very temple where Jesus is now walking. And this is not too long. This is not ancient history. This is very current for the Jewish people now. And he claimed himself to be God manifest. He took upon himself the name Epiphanes, God manifest. He claimed deity and commanded worship from the Jewish people. Now, of course, the Jewish people weren't exactly willing to comply, and the tradition is that they began to call him Antiochus Epiphanes, Epimenes, rather, which uh, loosely translated means crazy in the head. So there was this conflict and this controversy about a man claiming to be God, and it had to do with Hanukkah, and it took place in the temple, and now Jesus, on that very festival, walks in to the temple and says, I and the Father are one. Wow. Never should we be ashamed to make the claim that Jesus himself made. The deity of Christ is under attack in many quarters, even of the church today. Jesus claimed to be God. No equivocation. And if you wonder about that claim, if he really meant what he said, the people who heard him understood best. And what did they do? Those Jewish leaders there picked up stones to stone him, John tells us. Now where in this chapel, Chaplain Bill, do we have our pile of stones for heretics? Do we keep a pile? No, most sanctuaries don't. And if you think about it, the temple was the most ornate of all of the sanctuaries of the ancient world. Beautiful. So why were there stones just laying around willy-nilly on the floor? Well, perhaps. But let me suggest one other possibility to you. In the story of Hanukkah, when the pig was sacrificed on the idol, uh, on, the, uh, on the altar, rather, there was uh, a porous stone that that altar was made of. And this pig blood soaked into that stone, making it absolutely unusable for the future. And so one of the big challenges the Maccabees had was to redo that altar, which they did. And, but the big controversy, which the rabbis quibbled about for some weeks, was what to do with the defiled stones. And they said they should be thrown out, some of them. And others said, no, they can't be just thrown out. They were, in fact, the sacred altar. So after much debate and no decision, they dismantled the altar stone by stone, according to Jewish tradition, and left that pile of stones in Solomon's colonnade with this thought, when the Messiah comes, he will show us what to do with the stones. Interesting. And now at Hanukkah, we find Jesus in Solomon's colonnade claiming, I and the Father are one. Wow. Jesus' claim to being the Messiah is not complete unless he is also seen and proclaimed as God come in the flesh. When the Messiah comes, he will show us what to do with the stones. And that brings us to this very day, does it not? For are those of my people today who hearing the claim that Jesus is the Messiah and God manifest may in fact feel inclined to bend down to pick up a stone to cast at the Savior. But I am among those, and a growing number of my people who bend the knee not to pick up a stone, but to worship the one who is indeed Emmanuel, God with us. And I know that you share my hope that my people more and more will, as I have done, bend the knee and bow and worship in this holy season to recognize the one who is indeed born, the King of Israel. Let's pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you who have declared the end from the beginning, we thank you for the richness of your truth and the scriptures 
which are alive and so full of your divine imprimatur, so wonderfully woven together to reveal the picture of the Holy One of Israel, Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah. And we pray right now as our nation and this world enters into this sacred season that in the, the midst of the din of merriment and merchandising that the message of Messiah would be heard and received by Jews and by Gentiles. We want to be those who worship at your feet and declare you are indeed Emmanuel, God with us, the light of the world, the one who saves us to the uttermost. And we give you praise and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite you to stand. In conclusion, I would love to bless you with the blessing of the sons of Abraham from Numbers chapter 6, the Aaronic benediction, first in Hebrew and then in English, and then you'll be dismissed. Would you bow your heads, please? Yivarechecha Adonai v'yishmarecha Yo'er Adonai panavalecha v'ikuneika you saw Adonai upon the Valecha, the same Lecha Shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. Bashem Yeshua Mishi Chenu Sar HaShalom, in the name of Jesus, our Messiah, the Prince of Peace. Amen. God bless you. Shalom.